No, do not call me anymore. It's none of my business. Hello everybody, welcome to the channel. I am Kevlar Plays. Today I'm going to be taking a look at Autopsy Simulator. Uh, this is a demo as part of uh, Steam's Next Fest Festival. So uh, this is um, unfinished gameplay, so everything you see is subject to change. Um, How am I supposed to record a lecture for the students now? Feeling completely broken. So yeah, we're gonna have a quick look at this. I've had a, a little bit of a play, and uh, yeah, so far it seems to play quite well. Bottle of whiskey on the desk. So as the name implies, uh, this is a, a simulation of autopsies. Um, they're aiming for realism. I would like to just point out that uh, I have never partaken in an autopsy and uh, I've never seen an autopsy conducted. So I'm going to be looking at this with uh, a gamer's pair of eyes. Um, but uh, yeah, it should be, should be quite uh, interesting play. Uh, nice little note there. I'll get you. Another missing person. Is there a serial kidnapper in Peetsville? The New Orleans Police Department has received another missing persons report for an unidentified female, making it third this month. Is it just a coincidence or a meticulously crafted scheme? So, as well as being a simulator... Oh, I'm gonna go nuts if I don't take my pills. Okay, I guess we better go take his pills. Uh, but as well as being a simulator, uh, I get the feeling that there is a bit of a storyline to this game as well. be interesting to see how the uh, character develops as well as the... Uh... I borrowed it from Stephen uh, since Alice died. Stephen is the only person I trust. Um, yeah, so as well as the, uh, the character development, it'll be interesting to see where the story goes, whether or not you're um, involved in this uh, serial killer and uh, linking the deaths together. Love, Alice. Can't quite make out what was written on the tape. Oh, I think it's a little oil. Oh, the cops from Stephen's visit yesterday. I don't think he likes my coffee. He barely took a sip. Just a reminder, I'm seeing you on Friday. D. Okay, so we've had meetings with Stephen. Aerosmith. Nice. Oh shit. It's only Thursday. So we've got an Alice and a Stephen so far. How to break out of this vicious cycle. Guess we probably... I feel like an exhibit here sometimes. Guess we should probably go and uh, take his pills, go to the bathroom. Fuck. Where are my meds? <sighs> All right. Now I can go get the camera. 
which way? Uh, that that's the uh, that paint. Do not enter. It's locked. Just as well. Guessing it's not that way. It's nice to see all these little details. You know, all the all the different drawers and cupboards open. The light switches work. Just for those of us who are curious enough to want to click everything. <laughs> This place is starting to look like a garbage dump, rather than a storage room. Camera. <clears throat> well, I hope I won't forget to press the record button this time. Handman, set one tape aside for me. I need the camera for my niece's birthday on Saturday. A. Burrows. It's uh, quite the mess in here. <laughs> it's the same newspaper. Let's move on straight to our deceased. Okay. I'm wondering how the new tripod is going to work. Camera up here, I guess. Just frame it properly and... Oh, this should be fine. Here we go. November 21st, 1991. Time, 8.43 p.m. Recording for medical students from the University of Missouri. The autopsy is conducted by Jack Hammond. Ladies and gentlemen, it is always worth having a look at the files before conducting the autopsy. That is where we can find all kinds of clues to what could have potentially happened to the deceased. One file. Well, who do we have here today? Chambers. Mention the rookie mistakes. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. That's my Orion to sensify you for a few issues. First, due to the fact that in the process of revealing and securing forensic traces, interference that changes the primary condition happens. The photographic documentation plays a huge role in the entire process of examination. Then, the body needs to be placed on its back on the autopsy table. The pathomorphologist stands on the left-hand side of the body. Third, very rarely but still, the cause of death remains unknown if all the tests come out negative. That's the so-called white autopsy. Now remember that it can also happen. Okay. <laughs> Found on the outskirts of a parking lot near a gas station, where he often begged and insistently offered to clean the windows of cars that were leaving the station. The body was found in a dry field drain. A frequent cause of traumatic deaths among the elderly is the various types of accidents, including traffic accidents or falling down the stairs. The body was spotted by a station worker during the morning shift. At first, he thought that someone had thrown rain boots and a coat in a nearby ditch. It took him a moment to recognize a human body laying on its back. Signs of libation could be found around the dead body. Empty bottles, traces of an inept attempt to start a fire, and a scattered makeshift blanket. The deceased is locally known as Old Toby, homeless and unemployed for at least a couple years. He had gotten into fights and had been bullied by the problematic youth of the town. He was that type of a man who never kept up alcohol, which caused him to be homeless. As a young man working in a suburban coal mine most of his life, he already abused alcohol, and as the time went by, he'd fall into addiction more. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Although alcohol poisoning as a sole cause of death among the elderly people is relatively rare, different levels of alcohol poisoning happen among one in four deaths of elderly people, which may suggest that alcohol abuse is a significant issue in this age group. What is important to note, even though alcohol poisoning does not cause death, it does increase the risk of accidents and their following injuries. Okay, so... Uh... We could be looking at indications of intoxication. The body was found at 7 o'clock by Sheriff Matthew Thompson, 
White male, 76 kilograms, 5 foot 8. Age unknown. The deceased is a local homeless man named Toby Chambers. His son runs a hardware store. His wife ran away years ago. Local police have docked to residents, so we know more about the deceased. For example, that he loved drinking, and by no means was abstinent. Such clues can direct us to things that are worth keeping in mind during the autopsy. Mention the rookie mistakes, uh... Oh yeah, that's right. That's my orient to sensify you for a few issues. First, due to the fact that in the process of revealing and securing forensic traces, interference that changes the primary condition happens. Accidentally, uh... Oh, where are the damn gloves? Reactivated that dialogue then. <laughs> Okay, so we need to put on our gloves. Now we can get to work. We're going to need the camera. It should be here somewhere. That's a lucky find. <laughs> okay, we're looking for the camera. If I was to put a camera... Oh, must have left it in one of the drawers. I was going to say, if I had a camera, I'd leave it over by the computer. Oh, there we go. Let's follow the procedure and prepare photo documentation. We must follow the top-down rule. Luckily, we don't have to take pictures of the clothes this time. We are only focusing on the body. Let's keep in mind it's all about the legibility, not the perfect frame. Before we start searching for traces on the deceased's body, we have to take a main picture that goes in the files. Voila! Now we move on to the next step. Trace search. Hey. We're going to need better zoom here. Uh, it looks like uh, bruising. We're going to need better zoom here. Take it from this side. don't have to stand close to be able to smell a strong odor of alcohol and other discharges. There's nothing left to say. Old Toby didn't spare himself. Hey, so he's already thinking, um... Scum. People affected by homelessness most often die from accidents, alcohol abuse, or they freeze to death. Unfortunately, both suicide and homicide are also quite common. I think we need one more photo. Ah. We're going to need better zoom here. And that's perfect. That's a much nastier scar. While taking the photos, some entries that could be potentially lethal caught my attention. Let's take a closer look using the magnifying glass. Begin autopsy. <clears throat> okay. Tool wheel. There we go. Magnifying glass. An old wound that hadn't healed properly. It must have been some kind of burn or other injury. Nevertheless, it has nothing to do with the potential cause of death. Okay, so the areas we photographed are now highlighting in white. Hmm, that's something interesting. While making photographic documentation, ecchymosis can be seen on the deceased man's head. The appearance indicates the intravital nature of the wound. We'll come back later to see if everything is alright with the brain. There are frostbite marks all over the deceased's body, although they are most visible on the tips of his fingers. They can be recognized by the very specific color of the skin. However, the hands tell us much more. By the look of his feet, I assume Toby must have worn uncomfortable and dinky shoes for quite a while. However, 
Such wounds have nothing to do with his death. What do we have here? Okay. So from our notes, we've got the possible death causes. So we have a bloody hematoma. Further examination of the brain needed. Visible frostbite on the hands. Possible organ congestion. Scratches and other minor damage to the epidermis on the feet. A longitudinal scar. Possible cause a burn. And then an odour, an intense smell emanating from the deceased. Yeah, the odour can be the result of alcohol intoxication. An old wound that hadn't healed properly. It must have been some kind of burn or other injury. Nevertheless, it has nothing to do with the potential cause of death. By the look of his feet, I assume Toby must have worn uncomfortable and dinky shoes for quite a while. However, such wounds have nothing to do with his death. It could be freezing to death. The condition of the head tells us it could have been a fatal accident. Okay, so yeah, we've got, um... Bruising to the head, so he's either been hit on the head or possibly fallen. Maybe it was a result of... Drinking too much, perhaps? At this point... That's all I can do based on all traces on the body of the deceased. The inside should tell me much more. Let's move back to the body. Yeah. Well, just a, just a note to point then. If you're squeamish, I guess we're going to be performing uh, an autopsy of his insides. <laughs> Grab the right hand to perform. I grab. Oh, hand. Now let's check the level of muscle tension. This will allow us to establish time of death. Let's raise the deceased's hand. And then let go. The stronger the rigor mortis gets, the greater the resistance from the muscles will be. As you can see, the hand falls loose. The rigor mortis has already subsided. We can then assume that the time of death stated in the files is correct. Hmm. Let's grab a scalpel. Okay. You can boldly cut with the scalpel. It won't hurt him no more. We always start from the neck and move down towards the symphysis pubis. The incision should be deep. Next. We separate the skin and prepare to remove the ribs. Can't say I haven't warned you in advance. <laughs> Lovely. The adipose tissue has an intense yellow hue. As you probably already guessed, we're going to need the scissors. Lopers or loppers? Oh, oh dear. After removing both cartilage and bone tissues, we are actually interested in two things that you can see at the very first glance. The lack of organ congestion means that, although the deceased was cold, hypothermia wasn't the cause of death. Oh, that was, um, hmm. <laughs> Rather chilling, cutting through the uh, the rib cage. Then, so we need the magnifier again. Okay, so let's start from the top. Lungs. Part. It's part of the stomach. We can eliminate freezing as the cause of death. Okay. Take out the lungs and examine them. Sorry about this, sir. <laughs> Not that um, he'd be too bothered in this state, but... Very black, so that would possibly 
The deceased smoked like a chimney. Let's take a closer look. We see widespread black and tarry deposits caused by smoking cigarettes. Despite the tragic condition of the lungs, they are not the cause of death. Which is what I was about to suggest. <laughs> Now we need to go grab the syringe. Oh. At this point, we need to test the level of blood alcohol concentration of the deceased. So, uh, stomach? Or bladder? Now, we put the bladder and draw about 10 milliliters of fluid. Heart. We move on to collecting blood from the heart. Five milliliters from the left ventricle should do it. I. We also collect the fluid from the deceased to determine the level of alcohol concentration in the vitreous humor. Oh. Keep in mind that you have to set the right time and speed on both knobs before <laughs> the centrifuge. Our samples may break into pieces due to the centrifugal force if we set up the wrong coordinates. I myself am terrible with numbers because I suffer from dyscalculia. Which is why I always keep the appropriate coordinates at hand. Over here, I guess. 40 minutes, 75%. 40 minutes, 75%. Oh, it brings it over. That's handy. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to try to remember that then. Forty minutes. Seventy-five percent. Start mixing. Nope. That's not. Ah, uh, damn it! If something goes to shit, it's all the way. That's probably the blown fuses again. Hold up, I must have had a flashlight somewhere. Okay. <laughs> So now we're in a morgue with the lights off. Right. Oh. What's this? Left hand frostbite. Head bloody. Toby chambers. Chest burned. Left foot skin abrasion. I don't want to disturb the neighbours. No, especially not with the lights off. Ugh. And I was hoping to clock out early today. Oh! <laughs> that? Where did it go? Blimey. Don't remember signing up for this. <laughs> I thought I was playing a simulation, not a horror. <laughs> go to storage. Storage. Yeah, it's definitely the fuse. Oh, there's a fuse box over here, wasn't there? Right goes first, left next. Right first. And left. Voila. Oh. Uh, where's that unbearable noise coming from? Okay. <laughs> Sure, I closed the window. Okay. <laughs> Just um, close that. Okay, so this. The homeless probably misses me already. This game uh, kind of took a turn. <laughs> see what we've got here. Well, everything is telling us that the BAC, blood alcohol concentration, is high, hence the smell we're getting from the deceased. Still, to be 100% sure, I have to send the samples to the lab. Unfortunately, I don't have the equipment to conduct a detailed analysis here. Interesting. Take out the stomach. Hmm. 
Now let's take a closer look at the stomach. God, I get it to line up. There we go. As expected, the stomach has no major external damage. In this case, further inspection is no use. We must cut him open. Okay. I guess we're going to cut open a stomach. And this is where a steady hand is required. Uh, there we go. Not that um, we're going to be putting it back together again, but... Uh, Hmm. That's interesting. In addition to a large amount of gas and liquid, the stomach also contains small amounts of yellow-grayish food content resembling some kind of meat. Either our deceased hadn't eaten in days, or some of the bulk of his stomach had found a way out. Hey. Oh, it couldn't have been suffocation, could it? Now we need to focus on the cardiovascular system, especially the heart. We take the organ and look it up and down, carefully. Hmm. Could that be suffocation? Got the heart. At first glance, the heart looks fine. The pulmonary trunk and aorta seem to be in good condition. There are no pathological changes that have contributed to our Toby's death. Well, once we've got the body ticked off, we can move on to the head. But take the saw? Let's take the autopsy saw to cut through the skull to cleave it in two. Remember, the skull, not the saw. Okay. Anyway, we will start dissecting the brain from the occipital lobe. In this way, the brain's dermata is slowly revealing itself. Nice. After the basic examination, we can see that the cerebral gyri in both brain hemispheres are symmetric and the bumps between them are clear. So far, so good. The hematoma seems to have had no effect on the organ we're examining. Let's check its transection. Moving on to the incision. So although he's got a head injury, it's not contributed to brain injury. Holding a knife with a long, narrow blade in your dominant hand, cut the cranial nerves on both sides, pulling the brain towards you. Got my concentration face on now. Uh. Remember, just one small fragment examined under the magnifying glass is enough to dispel or confirm our doubts. We then take the fragment of the brain to the tray and, literally and figuratively, go over it with a fine tooth comb. Just as I initially suspected, we can rule the fatal accident out as well. Hey, okay, so there's no external pathological changes organ in good condition. The bloody hematoma on the deceased's skin did not affect the state of the brain. The brain gyri? Symmetrical? The furrows are clearly visible.
So, examine the trachea. Same as we did with the stomach. External inspection didn't tell us anything. Now the scalpel comes into- While cutting a small organ, such as the trachea, we must perform a precise incision. To be able to cut with the very tip of the blade, we must hold the knife as if it was a stylus. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've got it. Hey. Based on the report and preliminary documentation, it is safe to assume that the deceased passed out after consumption of alcohol and then fell asleep on his back. Then the gastric contents refluxed and flooded the airways causing death. That's why we don't forget about the recovery position at dorm parties. And now it's all clear. The death was caused by suffocation. Okay. So, uh, no clear external pathological changes, organ in good condition, cross-section required. Stomach examination showed that its contents may have escaped through the trachea. <coughs> Cause of death asphyxiation. The cause of asphyxiation or drowning was the withdrawal of the stomach contents to the trachea and respiratory tract flooding. So, in layman's terms, yes, uh, it appears he'd had too much to drink, had passed out, and then was sick and essentially uh, choked and suffocated on his own vomit. Not the most pleasant of ways to go. Oh, I've got to sign this. Um, so it was J. Hammond. There you go. That, that's my uh, my best J. Hammond. It went quite smoothly today. I'm about to get off. Okay. Close the chest. In order to bring the chest of our deceased back to its initial state at least to a small extent. We must take the needle in our hand. Sew him back up. We sewed the deceased using the baseball stitch technique. This stitching method is very strong and quick to do. I should probably get to that. Must be my office. I'm coming, I'm coming. Ugh. This is Dr. Jack Handman. Please leave a message. Good evening. How are you? How are you? How are you? What the f- is that supposed to be? I'll finish the stitching and I'm getting the fuck out of here. Okay. This, this game just seems to get creepier and creepier. As if performing uh, autopsies wasn't... Um... What the wow. Fuck? Okay. That was a cliffhanger. <laughs> You come back to find the uh, the corpse missing. Right, well, thank you for joining me during my uh, first play of Autopsy Simulator Demo. Uh, it is available on NextFest uh, on Steam if you'd like to quickly download a copy before it disappears. Um, otherwise, I think I will be watching this game very closely as it looks very, very interesting. Thank you once again for joining me. Take care of yourselves wherever you are, whatever you're doing. If you'd like to check out some of my other videos, I also have a, uh, a video of a roleplay playthrough through Fears of Fathom. In the meantime, take care, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye-bye.